Imagine being able to see the world through the eyes of artificial intelligence, where a simple text prompt can bring to life incredible, stunning images. That's the power of deep generative models, and you're in the right place to unlock it. I'm John, your instructor from Digital Tech Academy, and I'm thrilled to take you on this exciting journey. You may have tried your hand at generating images using phrases like sci-fi Blade Runner style city, or fantasy Lord of the Rings landscape, and the results left you amazed. And even the most peculiar prompts like a Pikachu fine dining with a view of the Eiffel Tower yielded an image that made you curious. You want to know the secrets behind these models. You want to understand how a machine can generate art. And most importantly, you want to have the power to generate images yourself writing the code. So welcome to our course on Deep Generative Models. This course will introduce you to the exciting world of deep generative models, which are a type of artificial intelligence capable of creating new contents, like images, from scratch. You will learn how these models work and how they can be used to generate a wide range of images, from realistic photographs to highly stylized artistic creations. Throughout this course, you will have the opportunity to work with state-of-the-art deep generative models and learn how to use them to create images that meet your specific needs. You will also learn about the latest research and development in the field and how these models are being used in a variety of applications, including graphics, art, advertising, and more. You will also learn how to implement these models using popular deep learning frameworks like PyTorch. In addition to the lectures, we will also have hands-on coding sessions where you can apply your knowledge to real-world tasks. Whether you're a seasoned AI practitioner looking to expand your skills or a beginner just starting out in the field, this course has something for you. So let's dive in and start exploring the incredible potential of deep generative models. Hello and welcome back. What will you learn in this course? For each type of model covered in this course, we'll start with intuitions on how the model works, so you can quickly understand the key concepts. Then we go on to describe the details of the model. We will go into the technicalities, discuss the math behind the model in a simple, easy and understandable way. We'll let you understand it so you can replicate the model yourself. At this point, you're ready to write code that implements what you learned in the section. We will see together the code written from scratch and you will understand every detail of the code itself. The code is written in Python and uses the PyTorch framework. You won't need to install anything as we will be using Google Collab. You'll start by getting a solid foundation in the basics of generative AI and how it works. From there, we'll dive into the specifics of autoregressive models and variational autoencoders. And you'll get hands-on experience building and training your own models. Next, we'll cover generative adversarial networks, normalizing flows, and diffusion models. These cutting-edge techniques have been used to create some of the most impressive image generation results to date, and you'll learn how to implement them in your own projects. We'll also delve into the details of specific implementations such as DAL-E2, Imagine, and Stable Diffusion. By the end of this course, you'll have a deep understanding of the latest techniques in generative AI and how they can be applied to image generation. So let's get started and dive into the world of deep generative models. See you in the next lecture. Hello, and welcome back. Let's start by introducing what is meant by generative models. Generative models use artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms to artificially generate new content, and the result you get is so perfect, or at least should be, that you think this content is real when instead it was generated by an algorithm. Examples of content that can be generated are images, text, video, speech, sound, or code. In this course, we will mainly focus on the images, but we will also see some ideas from other kinds of contents. Let's start by looking at some examples of images generated by generative models. In this slide, it is possible to see the absolutely realistic photographs of two people as if they were taken by a camera. In reality, these images have been completely generated by an artificial intelligence algorithm and, 
As the URL present in this image says, these people do not exist. If you want, you can try to go to the URL given below and see for yourself what happens. In this slide, we can see another example of artificially generated images. These look like drawings created by an expert draftsman, but in reality, they were created completely from a generative model. Again, the URL is at the bottom of the page in case you want to give it a try. In the previous slides, we've seen images of both people and computer-generated anime, but in that case there was no possibility to insert the characteristics or to generate exactly the image we want to generate, just random faces or anime characters. In case we want to generate from images based on a description, it is possible to do so. Here we can see two examples that were generated from the OpenAI DAL-E2 model. On the left side, we can see an image obtained by inserting the text an astronaut riding a horse in a photorealistic style, while on the right side, we can see an image that was generated starting from the text a bowl of soup that looks like a monster spray-painted on a wall. These results are absolutely incredible. And what about the technique of seeing how your face would look in the future, or how it would have been in the past? In the slide, it is possible to see the image of a face in the centre, while on its right, it is possible to see the image of the aged face, and on its left, the image of the rejuvenated face. Another sector where generative models can help is in the so-called domain transfer. On the left, you can see a painting by Monet that can be translated into its corresponding photorealistic image. The same thing can be done starting from a photo, obtaining the corresponding painting as if it had been painted by Monet itself. In the middle, it is possible to see how starting from an image of zebras, one can obtain the corresponding image with horses that take the place of the zebras. The exact same thing can be done starting from images of horses by obtaining the corresponding image with zebras. While on the right, you can see how an image taken in summertime can be transformed into its respective winter image and vice versa. Starting from a winter image, you can obtain the corresponding summer image. An additional interesting function that can be obtained with generative models is the so-called image-to-image translation. Basically, you start from a certain type of image and you get the corresponding image. For example, it is possible to start from labelled images of a road and obtain the corresponding image, but we will talk more about this in the next slide. Another example is the possibility of doing the same thing not starting from images of a street, but from those of a building facade, or the possibility of transforming a black and white image into the corresponding colour image. Starting from an aerial view of a city, we can get into the corresponding map, or starting from an image taken during the day, it is possible to see the equivalent as if it had been taken during the night. If, on the other hand, you prefer to draw a sketch of any figure, artificial intelligence can transform it into the corresponding photorealistic image. Generating images from segment labels can be extremely useful in fields such as autonomous driving, where it is necessary to generate many realistic cases in order to train neural networks to drive autonomously. By artificially generating these images, it is possible to create datasets much faster and cheaper than filming them in the field. It also gives you the ability to easily create totally improbable scenarios, such as reindeer walking in the middle of a street in New York City. Image inpainting is the technique that allows you to reconstruct an image that lacks pixels because, for example, they have been erased. In particular, in this slide, we can see in the centre of the input image to which some pixels have been removed, while on the right, there is the corresponding reconstructed image. You can compare this image with the original one on the left to see that the result is quite impressive. Image super resolution is a technique used to enhance the resolution of an image or video beyond its original resolution. It involves using algorithms to increase the size of the image by filling in missing detail and effectively upscaling the image. Image super resolution can be useful for a variety of applications, including improving the quality of images for display or printing, increasing the detail in images for scientific or medical analysis, and enhancing the resolution of images or videos for film or television production. So far, we've talked about examples that mainly concern the generation of images, as we had already anticipated. Generative modelling techniques can be used not only to generate images, 
but also to generate video sequences. In this slide, you can see some examples taken from an artificial intelligence of Meta, and in particular, this is a generation of videos starting from a text. For example, on the top left, you can see in the video corresponding to the text, a dog wearing a superhero cape flying through the sky. On the top right, the video that is obtained from a spaceship landing on Mars. On the bottom left, the one from the text, an artist's brush painting on a canvas close up, highly detailed. Finally, on the bottom right, you can see the video generated starting from the prompt, a horse drinking water. Video generation is a very exciting topic and much progress is expected in the near future. Similar to video generation, natural scene generation can create video content. In this case, the generation is not based on a text, but on a starting image that is taken as input data. Based on this image, the model is able to create a natural scene video that is consistent with the initial frame. As you can see, it is not perfect yet, but the result is already stunning. Inverse Graphics studies inverse engineering of projection physics, which aims to recover the 3D world from 2D observations. Here you can see an example. Starting from images of different people and having a desired pose to assume, the algorithm is able to generate the corresponding 3D shape of the people. Not just pictures and videos. Generative models can be used to generate, for example, even music. Here you can see a method of translating music across musical instruments, genres and styles. If you want to know more, you can take a look at the given reference. We have seen a whole series of examples of how using generative models it is possible to obtain new content. In this final slide, you can see a list of companies that are working on these issues at the moment. This data was obtained from Sequoia Capital, and as you can see, there are a whole range of companies that are working on generative AI related to text, video related, image related, code generation, 3D model generation, or more. The field of generative models is certainly a field in huge and strong expansion, where great progress is being seen, and where a lot of effort is being put into research. And it is certainly one of the great topics that will keep his company in the near future. Hello and welcome back. In this section, we're going to see some application for generative models. What we will see are just a few examples because the number of applications for this technology are countless. Generative AI can be useful in situations where there is limited data available. For example, it can be used to generate additional views of an X-ray image to help visualize potential tumor growth. It can also be used to detect abnormalities by comparing images of healthy organs with those that are affected. Generative models can be used for movie restoration by using machine learning algorithms to analyze and enhance the quality of old films. This can include upscaling the resolution to Ultra HD, increasing the frame rate, removing noise, and adding color to black and white films. By using these techniques, it is possible to improve the visual quality of old movies, making them more accessible and enjoyable for modern audiences. AI can be utilized to create 2D images and 3D models, which have various uses, such as in computer games and animated videos. These models are trained on large sets of pictures or 3D models and can subsequently be used to generate new, lifelike images or models that resemble those in the training data. This is particularly beneficial when a high volume of images or models needs to be generated, or when there is a requirement to produce images or models that aren't present in the training data. For photo editing, generative AI can be used to enhance the resolution of the poor quality pictures, to color black and white images, to turn a day photo into a night one, to convert any of them into an artistic painting, to removing the background or to removing unwanted objects in the photo. Generative models are useful to create images based on text descriptions. These image synthesis algorithms have a wide range of applications, including advertising, product design, set design, and film. However, there is also the potential for these algorithms to be used to generate misleading, deep fake images of events that never happened, which can be a cause for concern. AI can be utilized to generate exclusive, one-of-a-kind digital artwork, which can then be represented as non-fungible tokens, NFTs. 
These NFTs can be purchased and sold on online marketplaces and are often used to symbolize ownership of a digital asset, such as digital art. The market size of non-fungible tokens is anticipated to increase from USD 3 billion in 2022 to USD 13.6 billion by 2027. By using generative AI, digital art can be created by training a machine learning model on a data set of images or other art, and then using the model to generate new, unique art based on that training. These generated artworks can be represented as NFTs, allowing them to be easily traded online. Generative models can be applied to the field of audio synthesis for a variety of purposes, including music generation, sound design, audio restoration, music transcription, and audio enhancement. These models can create new music tracks, generate unique sound effects, restore damaged audio recordings, transcribe music into sheet music, and improve the quality of audio signals by removing noise and increasing clarity. Speech synthesis is the process of creating artificial human speech using computers or other devices. It can be used for text-to-speech applications or to replicate the voice of a specific person. This technology allows computers to produce human-like speech that can be used for a variety of purposes, such as providing spoken descriptions of visual content or generating audio versions of written documents. AI can be used by software developers to automate various tasks related to code writing and review, bug detection, software testing, and project optimization. These tools can help to improve productivity, speed up time to market, and save cost by creating scalable and efficient workflows. Generative AI can be used to create synthetic datasets for training machine learning models. These synthetic datasets can be used in a variety of applications including to augment existing datasets, to test machine learning models, or to train models in cases where real-world data is not available. Generative models can be used to create synthetic datasets that are similar in structure and content to real-world datasets, allowing machine learning models to be trained on data that is representative of the real world. Generative AI can be particularly useful in cases where collecting real-world data is time-consuming or expensive. AI is being used in the pharmaceutical and academic research fields to design proteins for medicine. These models can help predict the folding of proteins, which has been a long-standing challenge in the fields of genetics and pharmaceutical development. For example, AlphaFold is a machine learning system developed by DeepMind that uses a neural network to predict the 3D structure of proteins from their amino acid sequences. The system was trained on a data set of known protein structures and can accurately predict the 3D structure of a protein even if it has never seen that protein before. AlphaFold has been widely recognized as a major scientific breakthrough. AI is also contributing to genetics research. Geneticists are learning to understand gene expression, how specific genes and combinations of genes get turned on and off, and what genes do when they are active. AI is also helping researchers predict how a gene expression will change in response to specific changes in the genes. This shows enormous promise for the development of gene therapies. Generative AI can be used to design machine parts and sub-assemblies, and can optimize the design for various aspects of the manufacturing process, such as minimizing materials waste, using the fewest number of parts, and increasing the speed of production. Numerous companies are developing applications to generate virtual spaces for game designs or for metaverse. These AI systems can constantly generate new spaces and possibly even make them infinitely expandable. What we have shown so far are only a few examples of what generative AI can do. The possibilities for this technology are vast and limited only by one's imagination. In the next lecture, we will continue exploring the capabilities and potential of generative AI. Hello, and welcome back. In this lecture, we'll speak about input data. Any algorithm, including those of artificial intelligence, needs input data to process. If the data originally came from a physical signal, it must first be converted into an electrical signal by a sensor before it can be digitized, 
and processed by the algorithm. The sensor serves as the device that translates signals from one energy domain into the electrical domain. There are various types of sensors that can be used depending on the original energy domain of the signal. Examples include position sensors, pressure sensors, temperature sensors, etc. A pressure sensor, for instance, converts mechanical pressure energy into an electrical signal. A temperature sensor converts thermal energy into an electrical signal. A wide range of various sensor types can be located here. Now let's examine some specific examples of sensors. A microphone functions as a type of pressure sensor by converting changes in air pressure into mechanical movement, such as the movement of a diaphragm. This movement is then transformed into an analog electrical signal. An image from a camera is produced by a photon sensor, like a charge coupled device, CCD, which converts light energy into an analog electrical signal. An analog signal from a sensor can be converted into a digital signal using an analog to digital converter. This process allows a physical quantity, such as pressure, to be translated into a digital code which can be used as input for an algorithm. The digital code can be arranged as a one-dimensional vector for an audio signal, where each element represents the amplitude of the pressure signal and is obtained by sampling the analog signal at a fixed frequency. The digital code can also be organized as a two-dimensional array for a camera signal, with each element in the matrix corresponding to a pixel in the image. Each matrix represents a single image, and multiple image frames are recorded in multiple matrices. As an example, consider the following image. On the left is the original image with low resolution. In the middle, each pixel is displayed with its numerical value, and on the right is the resulting matrix. If the original image consists of n by n pixels, the resulting matrix will also have dimensions n by n. This process applies to grayscale images, in which each pixel is associated with a single numerical value. For color images, the process is slightly different. It is possible to create any color by combining three basic colors, such as red, green, and blue. Therefore, each pixel in a color image corresponds to three numbers representing the amount of red, green, and blue. As a result, three n by n matrices are needed to represent a color image, one for each color. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Thank you, and see you at the next lecture. Hello, and welcome to this lecture on neural networks. We will give you a general overview of the topic, but not go into great depth. This should provide you with a basic understanding of the subject. If you already have some knowledge on the topic, I hope this overview will still be useful to you. In mathematics, a function is a relation between a set of inputs, called the domain, and a set of possible outputs, called the codomain. A function assigns a unique output to each input in the domain. A function can be thought of as a box that takes in a numerical input and produces a numerical output. In the example shown, the function is defined as y equals x plus 1, and the input-output pairs can be seen in the table. For instance, if the input is 0, the output is 1. If the input is 1, the output is 2, and so on. Here, you can see examples of functions that are commonly taught in mathematics courses. Each function is plotted on a graph with two axes, the input on the x-axis and the output on the y-axis. The question naturally arises, why are we talking about functions? To give an answer, let's take, as an example, this image on which an object detection algorithm is performed. For each detected object, the algorithm identifies the type and draws a bounding box around it on the image. If we consider object detection in terms of mathematics, the input is an image represented by matrices for the red, green, and blue color channels. The function takes these matrices as input and produces output in the form of labels for the detected objects and coordinates for the bounding boxes drawn around them. Essentially, 
The object detection algorithm is a function that takes numerical input in the form of matrices and produces numerical output that are the labels and the bounding box coordinates. Even though this particular function is quite complex, it is still a function at its core. The universal approximation theorem states that for any mathematical function, there exists a neural network that can approximate it. This is why neural networks are commonly used in machine learning. They are excellent at approximating functions. Neural networks, also known as artificial neural networks, are a subset of machine learning and are at the heart of deep learning algorithms. They are so named because they mimic biological neurons and their connections in the human brain. A biological neuron is an electrically excitable cell that communicates with other cells via specialised connections called synapses. A synapse is the point at which electrical signals, or nerve impulses, are transmitted from one cell to another. Synapses are important for communication between neurons and are essential for the proper functioning of the nervous system. They allow neurons to transmit information to each other and to other cells in the body, enabling us to think, move and feel. At the synapse, the electrical impulse is converted into a chemical signal. This occurs when a neuron releases a neurotransmitter, a chemical substance that carries the impulse across the synapse to the other neuron or muscle cell. The receiving cell then converts the chemical signal back into an electrical impulse and passes it on to the next cell if it meets certain criteria. The artificial neuron emulates the biological neuron. It receives multiple inputs named x1, x2, etc. on the figure and multiplies each input by a different weight, w. These weighted inputs are then summed together to create a single number which is passed through a nonlinear function called the activation function. In short, the neuron takes in multiple inputs, calculates a weighted sum, applies a nonlinear function, and produces a single output, labelled as YF. Artificial neurons can employ different types of activation functions, which are nonlinear or piecewise linear functions. Some common activation functions include the ReLU, rectified linear unit, and the leaky ReLU. The ReLU is a piecewise linear activation function that is computationally efficient and does not saturate during training, making it easier to train the network. However, in some situations, a ReLU unit can die during training, which can be mitigated with techniques such as the leaky ReLU. The top half of the slide compares biological neurons to artificial neurons. The bottom half shows how biological neurons are connected to each other and how artificial neurons can be connected to create an artificial neural network. These networks of artificial neurons are designed to mimic the way biological brains function, and as mentioned earlier, they are capable of approximating any mathematical function due to the universal approximation theorem. We now understand that an object detection algorithm can be represented as a mathematical function, which can be approximated by a neural network. We also know that an artificial neuron is a fundamental building block of a neural network. However, one question remains. How do we get the neural network to perform a specific task or approximate a particular function that we don't know beforehand? The answer is through learning from data. We provide the neural network with input data, in this case, images, and corresponding desired output data, the object detections, and the network learns to map the inputs to the outputs. This process is known as training the neural network. The process of training a neural network to perform a specific task involves using a technique called backpropagation. This involves presenting the network with input data and the corresponding desired output, and then adjusting the network's parameters to minimize the error between the desired output and the output produced by the network. This error is calculated and then propagated back through the network, allowing the network to learn and improve its performance. By minimizing the error, we can ensure that the network's output is as close as possible to the desired output.
While it is important for a neural network to accurately produce the desired output for a given set of input data, it is also important for the network to be able to generalize this learning to new data. For example, if we train a neural network to recognize dogs using a set of images of dogs, we want the network to be able to correctly recognize new images of dogs that it has not seen before. In order to achieve this generalization, the neural network must be able to make use of the patterns and features it learned from the training data to make accurate predictions on unseen data. One of the strengths of neural networks is their ability to generalize their learning to new data. Research has shown that deep neural networks, that are networks with many layers, tend to perform better in terms of generalization than wide neural networks, that are networks with fewer layers but more units in each layer. This is why deep neural networks are widely used in many applications. You might wonder why the use of neural networks has exploded in recent years, despite being studied for decades. The answer lies in the convergence of several factors. The availability of powerful hardware, such as GPUs, a large amount of data to use for training neural networks, and efficient algorithms. These elements have only recently come together, making it possible to effectively utilize neural networks in a variety of applications. We hope you gained some valuable insights from the lecture. Thank you for your time. See you at the next one. Hello, and welcome back. We're going to talk now about supervised versus unsupervised learning in neural networks. In the previous lecture, we discussed the use of a supervised learning algorithm for object detection. In supervised learning, the goal is to find a function that maps input data to corresponding output labels. This is done by providing the neural network with both input data and the desired output labels, and adjusting the network's parameters to minimize the error between the predicted output and the desired output. It is called supervised learning because both the input data and the desired output labels are provided. A classification model is used to determine which category an object belongs to. Here, you can see an image represented by three matrices for the red, green and blue color channels, being input into a classification algorithm. The algorithm returns a numerical output, which can be mapped to a particular category using a corresponding table. In other words, the classification model takes in an image and produces a label indicating which category the image belongs to. As easily understood, the classification function has classified the image as a cat image. Object detection involves identifying and locating objects within an image. One way to represent the position of an object is by using a bounding box, which is a rectangle drawn around the object. When using an object detection algorithm, the function not only returns the category of the detected objects, but also the coordinates of the bounding boxes, typically the top left and bottom right corners. As you can see in the image, Two bounding boxes have been identified correctly. One has been tagged as a cat, the other has been tagged as a ball. Semantic segmentation is a type of machine learning that involves making detailed, pixel-level predictions about the categories of objects in an image. It is a natural progression from classification, which involves making a prediction for an entire input, to detection, which provides not only the categories of objects, but also their spatial locations. Semantic segmentation goes one step further by making dense predictions for every pixel, labeling each pixel with the class of the object it belongs to. In this way, it allows for very detailed, fine-grained inference about the objects in an image. The result of the semantic segmentation is the assignment of a label for each pixel, as can be seen in the slide. The blue pixels are the background, the red pixels are the cat, and the green pixels are the ball. The task of image captioning involves generating a short description in natural language of an image, capturing the objects depicted in the image and the relationships between them. Like in the case of object detection and classification, the image captioning algorithm produces numerical output, which is then mapped to words using a table. In this case, the mapping is referred to as tokenization. 
In this specific example, the result of the image captioning is a cat playing with a ball. Unsupervised learning involves using machine learning algorithms to analyze and group unlabeled data. These algorithms can discover patterns and relationships in the data without any human guidance. Its ability to identify similarities and differences in data makes it a valuable tool for many applications, such as, for example, clustering, dimensionality reduction, anomaly detection, recommender systems, generative models, and association rule mining. Clustering is a data mining technique which groups unlabeled data based on their similarities or differences. Clustering algorithms are used to process raw, unclassified data objects into groups represented by structures or patterns in the information. Dimensionality reduction is the transformation of data from a high-dimensional space into a low-dimensional space so that the low-dimensional representation retains some meaningful properties of the original data. Working in high-dimensional spaces can, in fact, be undesirable for many reasons. Raw data is often sparse, and analysing the data is usually computationally intractable. Working in a low-dimensional space is thus beneficial, and dimensionality reduction is the technique that can be used to achieve that. I hope the lecture was helpful for you. Thank you for your attention. We'll continue with the next topic in the following lecture. Hello and welcome back. In this lecture, we'll start to talk about generative models. Classifying an image as a dog or a cat falls under discriminative modeling. Producing a realistic dog or cat image is generative modeling. Generative models are machine learning models that learn to represent a probability distribution by training on samples from that distribution. They take in training data and learn a model that captures the underlying distribution of the data. It is important to note that data, such as images, can have very complex probability distributions. Before discussing generative models, it is helpful to discuss probability distributions. A probability distribution is a mathematical function that gives the probabilities of different outcomes occurring. As an example, consider rolling two six-sided dice and adding up the numbers. The probability distribution for the possible sums is shown in the figure. For each sum, the figure shows the combinations of dice that result in that sum. For example, there is only one combination of dice that results in a sum of two, whereas there are six combinations that result in a sum of seven. This means that it is more likely to roll a seven than a two. In particular, the probability of rolling a two is one thirty-sixth, while the probability of rolling a seven is six thirty-sixths, or one-sixth. In contrast, the conditional probability of distribution of y given x is the probability distribution of y when x is known to be a particular value. Continuing the example of rolling two dice, suppose we roll the dice, but now we know that one of the dice came up as a one. In this case, the value of one die is no longer unknown, so the probability distribution for the sum of the dice has changed. With this information, the probability of rolling a two is equal to the probability of rolling a seven, and both probabilities are one-sixth. The conditional probability distribution gives the probabilities of different outcomes occurring given that the value of x, in this case one of the dice, is known. The goal of generative models is to approximate the probability distribution of the data they were trained on. While discriminative models learn a probability distribution of label y given data x, generative models learn a probability distribution of data x and conditional generative models learn a probability distribution of data x given label y. Let us clarify. Discriminative models learn a probability distribution of y given x. For example, suppose we have a classifier that takes an image x as input and outputs a label y. If we input an image of a cat into the classifier, we want the model to output a label indicating that the image is of a cat. The model has several labels to choose from, such as cat, dog, duck, monkey, and sheep. 
we want the probability of the model outputting the label cat to be higher than the probability of it outputting any of the other labels. Otherwise, the model is not performing as expected. Mathematically, we are calculating the probability of getting the label y given the input image x. Generative models learn the probability distribution over all possible images. They're able to determine how likely an image is to exist based on the training data. For example, if a generative model has been trained to generate images of cats, the probability of the image on the left being a cat will be higher than the probability of it being a dog, and much higher than the probability of it being noise or a car. This means that the generative model has learned a set of rules that can be used as criterion for generating images. Essentially, it has learned the probability distribution of the data it was trained on and can use this distribution to generate new images that are similar to the training data. Conditional generative models learn a probability distribution over all possible images X for each possible label Y. For example, suppose we have a model that has been trained to generate images of cats, dogs, and cars. If we want to generate images of dogs, the probability of the four images in the slide being a dog will be higher than the probability of them being a cat or a car. This means that the model has learned a set of rules for generating images of dogs and can use these rules to generate new images of dogs that are similar to the training data. Essentially, by learning a conditional probability distribution, the model is able to use the label Y as criterion for generating images of a specific type, in this case, dogs. Bayes' rule is a mathematical formula that allows us to calculate the probability of an event based on prior knowledge of related conditions. It is named after Thomas Bayes, an 18th century English theologian and mathematician, and is commonly used in statistical analysis. The formula is generally expressed as the probability of x given y is equal to the probability of y given x multiplied by the probability of x divided by the probability of y, where p of x given y is the probability of event x occurring given that event y has occurred. p of y given x is the probability of event y occurring given that event x has occurred. p of x is the probability of event x occurring. And p of y is the probability of event y occurring. By using Bayes' rule, we can better understand the likelihood of an event occurring based on the relationship between different events or conditions and will be useful in this course. Bayes' rule allows us to compute the probability of an event based on related conditions. It connects the probability of a conditional generative model to the probability of a discriminative model and the probability of an unconditional generative model by expressing them as a ratio. Specifically, it shows that the probability of a conditional generative model can be obtained by multiplying the probability of a discriminative model by the probability of an unconditional generative model, and then dividing that result by the probability of each label. During this course, we will discuss both probability distribution functions and probability density functions. Distribution functions pertain to discrete random variables while density functions pertain to continuous random variables. While mathematically these are not the same, they can be understood as expressing similar concepts from a probabilistic perspective. In the course, we may sometimes switch between discussing distribution and density functions, but please be aware of this. In explicit density estimation, the probability density function of the data is directly estimated from the data. This means that the function is calculated based on the data. On the other hand, in implicit density estimation, a function is learned that can generate samples from the true distribution of the data, but the probability density function is not explicitly calculated. Instead of directly estimating the density, the function is able to generate samples that follow the desired density. Essentially, Explicit density estimation involves directly estimating the probability density function, while implicit density estimation involves learning a function that can generate samples from the true distribution. Thank you for your attention. 
We look forward to continuing our learning journey together in the next session.